Okay, I think we'll start. Welcome to this uh, seminar. Uh, my name is Panella Rikid. I'm a research professor here at NUPI, uh, coordinating our research on uh, Europe. Uh, and the title of today's seminar is Brexit and the Future uh, European Foreign Policy Coordination. As you know, the UK withdrawal from the EU has created great uncertainty about European foreign policy cooperation, at least among the big three or among France, Germany and the UK. So the question is, does the E3 format um, uh, 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 have a future after Brexit? Most of us who study EU, the EU foreign policy are aware of the importance of the Franco-German cooperation. Less known is perhaps the E3 format. As we will learn more about in this seminar, this trilateral coordination has been important in international diplomacy since 2003. For instance, this grouping has played an important role in the negotiation process that resulted in the Joint Cooperation Plan of Action, uh, the Iran deal, in, uh, that intended to uh, restrict the development of Iran's nuclear program. And it has also played an important role in other events such as climate change negotiations and in the relationship to North Korea. And more recently, it has also uh, been, uh, it has been suggested uh, as a possible format for European Security Council. But even if this format uh, or informal foreign policy coordination has uh, been remarkably solid, it has not yet evolved into a standing arrangement. It was not activated in the Ukraine conflict, for instance. And then, of course, Brexit has also created further insecurity on the UK's future role in European foreign policy. The question, however, is whether the E3 format once again will play an important role in the time to come, or whether Brexit instead uh, was the final blow for E3. We are very fortunate to have Professor Richard Whitman here with us today, who has accepted the invitation to talk on this issue. Richard is Professor of international politics uh, at uh, the University of Kent, and he is also director of Global Europe at the same university, Global Europe Centre. And he is also an associate fellow and former head of Europe program at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, known as Chatham House, and his current research interests include Brexit and especially the future foreign and security and defence policies of the UK and the EU. So Richard, thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very grateful that people are still interested in the UK. Uh, uh, I, it's very nice to talk about something which is not Brexit, but there is a Brexit element, uh, as you may imagine, as there's a Brexit element to anything when you talk about the UK these days. But um, I want to talk about this, this format, the E3, which may be familiar to many of you, um, but, but for others it's probably worth reminding ourselves that really the, the E3... Uh, came into existence uh, as a direct consequence uh, of Iran's uh, nuclear program uh, and Iran's uh, uh, really attempt to step up what it was doing as far as uh, the, uh, the, the development of nuclear uh, material with the suspicion, uh, the suspicion that Iran was seeking uh, to uh, acquire a, a nuclear weapon. And so the story <coughs> really for the E3, both in terms of its origins and some might say in terms of its durability, uh, is very much or has been linked to the question uh, of this nuclear diplomacy with uh, Iran. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but I'm not uh, an Iran uh, nuclear program uh, expert, uh, uh, but I think I know something about the E3. So uh, any of your questions uh, on Iran, Iran's nuclear program, probably better directed at the embassy here, and I'll take the E3 uh, questions. Um, <coughs> so what I want to do is talk a little bit about the E3, uh, talk about the way that the E3 uh, has uh, uh, operated. Uh, and one of the reasons why the E3 is interesting for us now, I think, is partly a consequence because um, as in its origin, and now we see a quite a lot of transatlantic divergence, which the E3 uh, is involved uh, in seeking uh, to manage, but also perhaps what may be less familiar for people here is that there has been an attempt to sort of build the E3 out from Iran uh, questions uh, across time. Uh, 
Uh, and then I really want to, to turn to a little bit more sort of future orientated stuff. I mean, it was already mentioned the European Security Council idea and how we might see the E3 uh, evolve uh, or not, or whether it might slip into to obsolescence. So we'll start, if you like, more empirically grounded and get more speculative uh, as time goes on. Uh, and if anything doesn't make sense while I'm talking, then please uh, stop me and I'll clarify. But if you violently disagree, maybe we can take that at the end uh, in questions. So, uh, the E3 uh, uh, as, uh, as a combination is obviously an arrangement that brings together UK, uh, France uh, and Germany in a very light touch arrangement in terms of organisational structure and it has uh, no uh, treaty basis but essentially has evolved uh, as uh, a set of practices uh, and as, uh, as an arrangement for coordination uh, between uh, the UK, uh, France uh, and Germany. And it's evolved uh, disconnected from but connected to the EU. And I'll clarify what I mean by that in terms of its origin uh, and the way that it has uh, operated uh, across uh, time. But it doesn't have, for example, a sort of summary format that you get uh, in the Franco-British uh, or the Franco-German uh, relationship. So we don't have a sort of trilateral summary uh, structure. Again, something I'll come back to a little bit later on. And one of the reasons why you know, I want to suggest to you that the E3 is of heightened significance in terms of uh, taking a look at, one is obviously Brexit, because it fits into, I think, the category of questions about how the UK fits not just with the EU, but its relationship with other European states and how it seeks to structure and organise its foreign and security policy post-Brexit. It very much fits with transatlanticism and particularly where we are uh, with uh, the relationship with Iran at the moment uh, and this sort of widening gap uh, across the Atlantic between the US uh, and Europeans on the questions of how to manage Iran and Iran's nuclear programme. Uh, and, and so the question, I think, is begged is the format that's evolved in the E3, which is connected to uh, the, Iran, um, the Iran diplomacy, in some way uh, an arrangement to manage transatlantic divergence, whether that's disrupted by Brexit or, or not, or whether it's an arrangement uh, that may well uh, endure or survive uh, the Brexit process. And one of the reasons why I think it's also worth taking a look at the E3 is that both in Paris... Uh, and in Berlin, there is interest in the perpetuation uh, of the E3 uh, format. Uh, uh, Ms. Kramp uh, Karrenbauer may not be the next German Chancellor, but she's been pretty uh, active uh, in her articulation of the importance of the E3. If you look at the speech that she gave at the Munich Security Conference, some media interviews just in advance of that, uh, and a speech, uh, this is a quote uh, from a speech that she gave in London uh, just in advance of, of Munich, uh, that there's been a lot of sort of playing up of the benefits uh, of the E3 format essentially uh, as a way of keeping the UK, France and Germany connected a major foreign and particularly uh, international uh, security uh, issues. So uh, I think it's worth making the point that this is not just a sort of, you know, a London initiative to perpetuate this idea, but I think there is a certain um, enthusiasm uh, to remain or to uh, continue with a connectedness between Berlin, uh, Paris, uh, and London, uh, even with all the complications that exist uh, in the relationship uh, between uh, the UK uh, and uh, the EU, and so by implication uh, with France uh, and Germany. Um, I apologise, this is, this is sponsored by Specsavers. Uh, but uh, what, I, what I wanted to, to really uh, just remind ourselves is that, you know, the Iran diplomacy has been going for a long time. Uh, and it means that the E3, as connected to the diplomacy with Iran, has a number of elements that I'm going to, to talk through just to, just to background. But it's obviously been primarily driven by changes in the political situation in Iran, changes of regime there, in particular the regime's attitude towards um, their nuclear program, but also their willingness to engage internationally and remain compliant with their IAEA uh, uh, obligations. But also, more recently, as I think you're well aware, you know, we've moved to a situation in which there's been uh, a breakdown, essentially, in, in the grand bargain that was the JCPOA uh, with the U.S., uh, walking away uh, from the agreement, 
uh, and now Britain, France uh, and Germany invoking the dispute mechanism uh, with Iran, even whilst trying to preserve uh, the, the agreement. So right from 2003, this is where we can really date uh, the E3, where uh, the E3 involved themselves in diplomacy uh, in Iran. It's worth for a moment just thinking about the context for that, which was, of course, against the backdrop uh, of uh, the Iraq War, against the backdrop uh, of the EU's first security strategy. Uh, and so for the E3, uh, it wasn't, I think, just a question of how you deal uh, with a, a diplomatic and international security problem, which was I Iran. I think there was also that kind of contextualization of sort of anxiety for Europeans to pull themselves back together again after a major uh, breach uh, in terms of their approach towards uh, international security questions. And in many ways, the sort of high point uh, of the E3 comes at the beginning, when it was just the E3 on its own, uh, which was negotiating with the, uh, uh, with the uh, regime in Tehran uh, to try and find a mechanism by which you would manage Iran. And absolutely crucially, and this has remained a sort of central component of the E3 position on Iran since, is basically to, you, to avoid the use of military force against Iran by the United States uh, and, or, uh, or, and or Israel. And I think that still remains a central tenant uh, of, of the E3 and indeed the EU's position uh, on the diplomacy uh, towards, uh, towards Iraq. So uh, really the, the, you know, the E3 uh, essentially kicks off uh, as this trilateral initiative uh, to try uh, and open up a dialogue with Tehran for the purpose of bringing Tehran into compliance with its EAIE uh, uh, obligations. But fairly early on in the process, once establishing an agreement or a declaration to lead to uh, a longer term process, there is this plugging the E3 into the EU. And this is another component of the E3 that one has to think about, one thinks about its durability, and particularly on the, uh, the Iran uh, issue, the Iran dossier, uh, that the E3 were outliers, were a vanguard, avant-garde, uh, directoire, however you want to uh, uh, articulate that idea. Uh, but they also connected what they were doing or plugged what they were doing into the EU structure. Uh, and at this stage or early on, this was pre-Lisbon Treaty, this was Javier Solania uh, as, uh, as high representative, pre-External Action Service uh, and so on uh, and so on. Um, uh, and then you also have the creation of this format which still endures, you know, the P5 plus one, which is how you connected the UN Security Council, which had a responsibility or took on a responsibility uh, for uh, Iran's, uh, Iran's misdemeanor, shall we say, uh, on nuclear questions, uh, and connect uh, Germany uh, into that as a non-permanent uh, member. So there are lots of different formats rattling around and lots of connectivity between the EU uh, or the E3 rather, uh, the EU and other members uh, of the Security Council, which we'll see uh, pops up uh, uh, over, uh, over time. And what's interesting when you look at the, uh, the E3 format is, of course, by and large, the E3 now stand behind the high rep, uh, both from uh, Solana, but also uh, Ashton uh, Mogherini uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and onwards. And part of the reason uh, for that is, I mean, essentially because of sanctions regime and sanction regimes against Iran, which means EU uh, sanctions uh, as well as uh, EU uh, leadership. But the agreement, the JCPOA uh, agreement, the agreement that was reached with Iran to manage its nuclear uh, program uh, over a decade was uh, a lot of the heavy lifting on that was done by the high rep with the E3 uh, in the background. So again, I think uh, questions about sort of connectivity between the EU um, and, uh, and the, the E3. But the JCPOA, the agreement that was reached with Iran, has the E3 as signatories, has the other members uh, or permanent members of the UN Security Council, and has the EU also as a signatory. So if you think, you know, the UK might be pushed out of the picture post-Brexit because it's about the EU, that's not the case because the UK remains a signatory to that agreement as well. So again, that raises questions, I think, as to whether the E3 format endures as long as the JCPOA uh, and the, the dialogue uh, with, uh, with Iran uh, endures, if that all uh, makes sense. Uh, and the JCPOA, for those who are unfamiliar uh, with the agreement, is essentially a trade-off uh, by which uh, Agr Iran agrees to oversight and management uh, of the nuclear material that it produces to remain 
basically within the, the, the confines of having uh, a sort of defensible civil uh, nuclear uh, program to avoid the breakout uh, into, uh, into weaponization. And in return that for that, I mean, essentially gets to, to trade normally with the world outside itself. Uh, and that's uh, been or is one of the major order challenges uh, at the moment that, uh, that we'll come back to, which is how the deal has, has in effect broken down. Um, it makes for very, very complicated photo ops when you have anything to do with uh, the Iran diplomacy. Because if, you're, uh, if you have the P5, or you have the P5 plus one, um, plus uh, you have uh, the EU, uh, you need a lot of flags uh, and you need a lot of bodies, uh, frankly. But I think it's a very, uh, you know, it's a very nice representation uh, of the fact that this is an arrangement which connects up in all sorts of ways. You know, you have the E3 at its core, which is plugged into the uh, EU by necessity and certainly as EU foreign policy uh, has evolved, but it also places Germany alongside the permanent members uh, of the UN uh, Security Council. Um, and again, we'll see that this, the P5-1 format has also uh, evolved since uh, in the, over the next little while, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, uh, in, uh, in a moment. The other interesting thing is when you look at the photographs across time is the change in foreign ministers uh, across, the, uh, across the E3. And it's always foreign ministers uh, that you see because as the point I made earlier about summitry between the uh, French head of state, German chancellor, and the British prime minister um, has not been prominent in the E3 format. I mean, this is foreign minister, by and large foreign minister and below uh, format, although we've seen uh, one example um, uh, different from that uh, more, more recently. So where we're at at the moment uh, is that the Iran deal, um, uh, I think it's probably fair to say, uh, is, um, uh, is wobbling. Um, uh, and it's obviously wobbling uh, because uh, the shift of policy on the part uh, of the Trump administration, which was its decision, first of all, to decertify and then revoke uh, the JCPOA because of a desire uh, both uh, to uh, impose sanctions on Iran, but also uh, with the uh, Soleimani uh, uh, targeted assassination uh, as well. So the U.S. Approach, uh, approach towards Iran has shifted from you know, having the JCPOA uh, as a way of managing uh, Iran, which was the, the policy uh, of uh, the Obama uh, administration to one in which essentially uh, the E3 uh, is playing a role as firefighters or committed to preserving the process. So in many ways uh, we're back to where we were at the start of the E3 process which is the E3 seeking to manage a relationship with Iran whilst dealing with uh, uh, essentially uh, a transatlantic divergence but the E3 now finding it much more difficult uh, to keep the US uh, on side so I think they're trying to preserve uh, or, or mitigate, and cynics might say, hang on until the next U.S. presidential election, you know, in the hope that there might be a change uh, across uh, across the Atlantic. And the interesting thing, I think, about the way that the E3 has approached this, uh, and perhaps tells us something about how invested um, the E3 themselves are uh, in the process uh, with Iran, their interpretation of the best way of managing Iran, but also where they're now willing to stick their necks out, is the kind of dual track. Uh, approach uh, that they've adopted, which is not just to disagree with the United States, not just to seek to preserve the agreement, but to take active measures to try and preserve the agreement by having workarounds uh, 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 as far as US sanctions are concerned the, and created this payment system called uh, INSTEX, which essentially is intended to work around the dollar and work around um, any uh, European entities which are involved in trading with Iran, um, having a payment system that's supposed to secure them or isolate them from sanctions uh, from the US. Um, so try and preserve the idea uh, with uh, Iran uh, that I they will continue to trade uh, as the JCPOA uh, intent is in return for, uh, for Iran's uh, compliance. And also at the same time, um, working on a P4 plus one format, which is basically the permanent members of uh, the UN uh, Security Council minus the United States plus Germany. This is a bit like algebra, isn't it? Uh, international relations algebra, who's in the room. Um, but it's interesting to you know, be working in that format uh, with a desire to try and preserve the process with the other stakeholders and signatories minus the United States. And that, I think, is quite a standout uh, position uh, for the E3 to lead on that, both in the diplomacy 
uh, as I say, but also um, working uh, within the EU system to instigate this uh, INSTEX uh, payment uh, system. But at the same time, to also uh, uh, be a bit uh, tougher uh, on Iran uh, by invoking the dispute mechanism of the JCPOA in response to Iran's statements that it will basically break out of compliance uh, with the JCPOA provisions uh, on the way that it uh, uh, manages and enriches uh, or the levels of enrichment that it uh, 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 engages in for, uh, for uranium. So uh, you've got a bit of a shift uh, there uh, and there was quite a lot of press reporting on this, that the Trump administration had threatened sanctions against European states uh, unless they toughened up their diplomacy with Iran. But it's something that's very difficult to bottom out, frankly, and we probably won't be able to fully understand what's go, uh, gone on uh, and, uh, until, uh, until we got, start to see people's memoirs uh, and official documents. But it looks as if quite some pressure was applied on the E3 uh, to, to also get tough uh, with uh, Iran. Uh, and as I say... Uh, sanctions or press reports on sanction threatened uh, on the uh, uh, on the uh, on the E3. So uh, we have this uh, this format where uh, this group of the E3 plus the EU. Uh, so we more commonly talk about the E3 slash EU format uh, when we're talking about the JCPOA. Um, uh, and this is when Boris Johnson was Foreign Secretary. Remember, he was Foreign Secretary before he was Prime Minister. Made a great success of that job. Um, uh, and uh, the, you know, the cast of, of personalities, as I say, uh, has, uh, has shifted, but the UK uh, has remained um, uh, connected to that process. So we've got the Iran, uh, the Iran story and a big, big part uh, of the E3 uh, dialogue or, 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 or behavior. Uh, it's been focused on Iran. I mean, that's the origin. There's been something very concrete, something very tangible, and one might say uh, a, a real significant differentiating issue, Europeans from the US, in terms of how you manage proliferation uh, activity. But we've had a certain amount of building out uh, of the E3 uh, uh, subsequently. Uh, in one of the most significant uh, areas, there is uh, now, or there has been, uh, E3 uh, summitry with Turkey. This is at the level of, of uh, heads of state, heads of government. Um, and the last of these took place on the fringes of the uh, London uh, NATO uh, meeting. But there's a lot of coordination between the E3 on Syria, uh, ISIS uh, type uh, issues. A lot of this under the radar, obviously, at uh, official uh, uh, level. Um, but that's, that is uh, probably the second order focus uh, of the E3 because it's also, of course, connected to Iran and Iran's involvement uh, in, in Syria, but more generally, you know, major order European security uh, challenge. You also, I think, uh, uh, if you just look at where the E3 decide to take a public position as opposed to their internal cons uh, consultations, it's quite striking that they are uh, willing uh, to do things together where there isn't an EU consensus, for example. Um, so that's been the case in the South China Sea, where the EU found it difficult to form a common position, and the E3 found it less complicated, which is essentially uh, that um, uh, their anxieties about China. Transatlantic differences, things like the Khashoggi uh, killing, very striking that the E3 uh, made a public statement, which was not one that they made alongside the United States. Uh, on that killing because it's much more condemnatory of Saudi Arabia. And I think striking there that the UK was part of that, bearing in mind the UK's relationship with Saudi uh, is, uh, uh, is a complicated but important uh, one. And then you've got these whole other different formats where the E3 plug themselves uh, together with other states, often connected to other non-permanent members uh, of the UN uh, Security uh, Council. Uh, and those are happening as much at the local level, you know, the, the level of embassies in third countries, uh, as much as they are, uh, if you like, at the, the level uh, or the foreign ministry uh, level. So I think, you know, there's a very interesting uh, uh, ecosystem, shall we say, uh, of connectedness uh, of public diplomacy um, and coordination uh, on issues. Uh, and, you know, very good, perfectly timed demonstration of this today, uh, the three uh, highest civil servants uh, of UK 
France and Germany, and for us, the Permanent Secretary of the, of the uh, Foreign Office, uh, is in Berlin uh, for uh, E3 uh, consultation, the first time that that's happened post-Brexit. So you might say that that indicates the E3 is going to continue uh, despite the Brexit process. I mean, we've obviously seen it uh, already uh, with the Iran uh, dialogue going on. But So there is Iran at its core, but there's been this breakout. And, uh, you know, the Turkey... Uh, the Turkey example being particularly interesting, I think this decision to have a sort of rolling or intended rolling summitary program with Turkey, which again is connected to Syria, which is connected to where I think the E3 think they may be able to do more together than they can do uh, as, uh, uh, as 27. So if you think about the E3 format, and I'm going to sort of move into this, this is my assessment of how it's operated so far. Um, uh, I, mean, I think it, it has provided a format for a more efficient style of European leadership. Now, whether you accept the E3 represents European leadership is obviously going to depend on what national capital you stand in. But there have been, I think, certain uh, efficiency uh, gains. And I think a key element of the E3, uh, and it's worth us thinking about then, its durability, uh, is about managing transatlantic differences, uh, and particularly uh, those three states looking for a means to uh, basically caucus on issues that they find they're in divergence with the United States on, but not doing that in other uh, institutional frameworks where they either might find that too difficult um, or they can possibly be, be a bit more candid uh, with, uh, with the United States. And it also, I think, has this, this uh, ability to bridge bill between the UK, France uh, and Germany, and that may well be one of its most significant post-Brexit functions in terms of keeping uh, the UK uh, of plugged in. The weaknesses, though, I think, I mean, it's largely, I think, sub-strategic sub in the sense that uh, there is no uh, uh, E3 uh, program, uh, if you like. There's no E3 uh, view uh, of the world. It is a pretty sophisticated uh, switchboard uh, operation, uh, I would say, at the moment, where there is, if you like, sort of hard wiring between the capitals on some key issues uh, and seeking to coordinate. And I think the real question that we could beg is whether it is really dependent on the JCPOA legacy. You know, if the JCPOA disappears, uh, then uh, does the E3 uh, as a format lose a lot of the motive power uh, which has existed, where you've seen you know, a significant international security issue, the E3 have been connected to, and have had a shared view as to how to manage that. If that falls away, if the agreement disappears, and in particular... Um, and, and Prime Minister Johnson uh, has sort of hinted at this uh, publicly, um, if there has to be a successor arrangement to the JCPOA, which leans more towards the Trumpian vision, does that introduce a sort of fracture within the E3, which sees the UK uh, go uh, more mid-Atlantic, uh, shall we say. Um, and uh, and uh, Penilla mentioned this earlier, you know, that this is very much been focused on process, not capacity, and it hasn't built out in all instances, which the Normandy format, uh, you know, the, the uh, diplomacy uh, on uh, Ukraine is a very good example of where, you know, it's a bit glaring the absence of the UK when one might have thought if you do hold to this as a format that you think is a format for looking at significant uh, international European security issues, the UK uh, should be present. That's not special pleading. It's just really, I think, it's striking that in that format the UK is not there if you follow uh, the logic um, of, uh, of the purpose uh, of the, the E3. As I say, you know, there is, but there is uh, the kind of, it's essentially foreign minister driven, uh, official uh, driven, but very little uh, by way uh, of uh, structure uh, and, um, and formal process in terms of the frequency uh, of summitry or foreign ministers meetings and so on is as needed, as required, as opposed to some other uh, formats, for example, the EU formats with third countries. I want to talk briefly, I'll do this for no more than about two minutes, about Brexit, um, not least because I can't take more than that uh, these days. Um, but it's worth thinking about Brexit in the context of the E3, obviously, because um, the UK is now in a period of transition for this year. Uh, this is how the UK plugs into EU foreign policy making. So between now and the end of the year, I mean, essentially, the UK uh, is the zombie member of the EU, which means that it needs to remain in compliance with EU foreign policy EU security uh, and, uh, and defence policy. But the end of the transition period, that requirement for compliance ends. And obviously, JCPOA, 
uh, and the EU's Iran policy is EU policy. Uh, so, in a way, the UK sort of break out. If it wanted to move away from the EU position, it's sort of locked in uh, for this year. There's obviously nothing in transition that directly connects to the E3, in the sense that the E3 is separate from uh, and not tied into the EU. So there's nothing that either prohibits um, uh, the continuation of E3 cooperation over this period, nor um, uh, changes or requires E3 cooperation to change, with the exception of the fact that the UK is obviously not now connected to the EU uh, structures of decision-making or uh, of information sharing on EU foreign policy. It's what I think we used to call for third countries foreign policy by fax, but I don't think anybody has a fax machine anymore. Um, so it's, it's you know, following on behind what the EU position is, but without making that position. The political declaration, which is the future relationship uh, declaration, which you could obviously take a look at, has this idea that there's going to be this future relationship between the EU and the UK, which is going to be an ambitious uh, relationship, um, that it's supposed to be in many ways a sort of strategic uh, relationship, but also lots and lots of nuts and bolts, um, which the uh, Theresa May was very keen on. Um, Boris Johnson, it's not so clear, uh, actually. Um, and so we may want to think about the E3 as an alternative formulation for what could end up being a very weak interface between the EU uh, and the UK. And essentially, the, the, the offering in the political declaration is the UK will be a third country. Why not? It is a third country. But all of the existing models of third country cooperation on foreign and security policy are pretty much um, unpalatable to the UK. I would say. So I think there's a huge gap between existing third country models and the rhetoric of the political declaration, which appears to offer something which isn't on offer when you look at the detail uh, of what's in the political declaration. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about that at length, but I want to make the point that um, you could have a situation in which there is an inability to realise the ambition that's in the political declaration on foreign policy cooperation and the UK-EU relationship could be left hanging, and would the E3 relationship or um, connectedness um, act or take on a different uh, feel if you have this very weak uh, EU-UK uh, relationship? So I'll just put that out there uh, for us to, to speculate on. But it's also worth us thinking about this idea that's floated around for a European Security Council. Now, this has appeared in different formats and different variations. Um, and how does this connect to the E3? So the idea of the European Security Council, which has been floated in uh, Berlin, it's been floated in Paris, and, and think tanks have had lots of fun writing about how this might operate. Um, and essentially, it's designed to solve European foreign security policy problem, which is how do you talk about the big stuff? And by implication, how do you get a smaller number of states into a room to talk about the big stuff? Now, that's the easy thing. The difficult thing is who should be in the room, how do you determine who's in the room, how does it connect to EU decision-making, uh, and so on and so on. And one variant of this suggests that it should be EU plus UK. But there's another version which says it should just be for the EU. So one account you could write the European Security Council is, in a way, a uh, potential successor arrangement for E3 cooperation. Um, um, and it is set up in a way that means you get more European foreign policy, more effectively coordinated foreign policy, and Brexit provides a rationale uh, for, for uh, doing this. But there are also questions about how other states fit in. If you have a European Security Council, how does the US connect? Because, of course, the US has a big stake uh, in European security. How do other third countries fit? You know, um, and so on and so on. So uh, this, is, this is a... Um, uh, this is uh, a bowl of spaghetti uh, in a bag of in a bag of snakes. I would say. I mean, it's really it's very difficult to see how you can work through all of the problems associated with this, and certainly the different perspectives that member states uh, will will bring to it. But I think it's worth keeping in mind um, as something that put, could put the E3 uh, format uh, out of business. Um, for the UK also, uh, but I think for other member states, if you don't have the European Security Council format if you don't have the connectedness uh, with the UK through the EU, that ends up being quite uh, a weak link, then it's the bilateral 
you know, we have, you know, what can be called promiscuous bilateral and various versions of bilateralism floating out there alongside the E3 format, which would be in the security and defence uh, policy area where there are the gaps. And, of course, we don't know what the gaps will be because if um, you see the development of PESCO, EDF, CARD, and so on and so on, you potentially see uh, the EU crowding out more and more the space that you might see bilateral cooperation with the UK. So you can see that we could have um, the E3 standing alongside all sorts of other bilateral, uh, uh, bilateral relationships that the UK may pursue if you don't have this, this EU format. So we've got, you know, we've got quite a lot of uh, unknowns, I think, frankly, uh, in terms of where the E3 might sit against other uh, competing ideas. But we've also got uh, an awful lot of other stuff going on that's probably going to be a uh, condition uh, what happens uh, with uh, the, the E3. One is, is the broader relationship between the UK, France uh, and Germany outside foreign and security policy issues. In other words, the extent to which uh, EU-UK relations impact on the E3, um, where the relationship becomes so bad in other areas, on trade, for example, that there's a bleed across. Transatlantic relations which, of course, um, are a major order uh, security management problem uh, for Europeans uh, at the moment. As I say, the broader EU-UK relationship where, I mean, I mean, is it going to be a complementary relationship is going to, going to be a competitive one? That's a great exam question uh, to which we don't have an answer yet, uh, and we probably won't get an answer for quite some time. Uh, and I think, last of all, the extent to which the EU realises on its ambition for the Commission to be a geopolitical commission, the extent to which there's a growth uh, of CS, uh, CFSP, CSDP, is there a breakout uh, which means that the UK becomes less important uh, in European security or of diminishing importance as the UK uh, takes on more and more capability um, uh, and so on. So there are a lot of things uh, to think about. So last, last few minutes, I'll just talk more in the sort of speculative mode, um, and I'd be interested in your views as to how you might see the E3 uh, evolve. Um, there is, I think, you know, it's demonstrated that the E3 can run a process, a very complicated process, and keep that uh, on, uh, on track. A part of the reason for that is it's been reasonably responsive and able to act quite quickly. I mean, EU policy making is relatively uh, uh, cumbersome and certainly uh, for doing transatlantic uh, stuff. Um, uh, and, you know, it has the potential to be a kind of outlier group to forge a position which can then be sold back or other states can tuck behind or even test uh, foreign policy uh, positions. And the extent to which it underpins bilateral cooperation, if you look at the triadic relationship between the UK, France uh, and Germany, there's obviously a strong uh, Franco-German relationship which is treaty-based, and provides for all sorts of bilateral uh, cooperation. There is a, uh, a Franco-British leg to that triangle, uh, which is the Lancaster House agreements, which are clear agreements on nuclear, but also on other aspects, particularly of, of conflict crisis management. And there's the E3I initiative, which keeps the UK connected to France and other member states. But the the British-German leg is much less developed. There's been a treaty mooted between uh, the two sides uh, on security and defence issues, but that ha yet hasn't come uh, to pass. And so in a way, the E3 is the, is the thing that may end up holding these uh, or being the connect connection that allows uh, these to, to work um, and potentially provides a sort of forum for strategic consultation. But you'd have to kick a lot more into the process, I think, than you've got now, and particularly much more prominence of prime ministers and so on and so on. So this is my attempt to sort of visualise where the future uh, might go. I mean, do you institutionalise more? It's a decision to be made. And do you expand uh, the scope? So this is where we are at the moment. A bit more institutionalisation. Uh, you can structure it in all sorts of ways, you know, in terms of frequency, uh, and so on. Uh, you could even decide to make it a treaty-based relationship, so you probably then have to spell out what the scope would be, uh, which means uh, that uh, you probably have quite a different proposition, something that perhaps looks a bit more like the Arkan Treaty, you know, France, Germany, maybe, uh, 
I don't know. Um, but there's also uh, a possible future they call the Flexi 3, which is that they kind of keep quite light touch in terms of the institutionalization uh, and, and that flex that they're built into the system where they can move quite nimbly. They're not perhaps as constrained um, by having a treaty-based arrangement, but they're kind of, they're, they're, this is a major order relationship for, for all three. They decide that this is something that they want to spend a lot of time doing. Um, and they also look to build out. And we've got examples of where they seek to build out that relationship already, bringing other states on side, as I mentioned, the, uh, things like the P, uh, P5 minus 1 and so on. But there is also, of course, another possible future, which is the thing just atrophies. You know, it just, it just ends up being of diminishing importance as the UK goes off and does something completely different uh, in its foreign policy, um, or uh, France and Germany uh, just feel that the value of the format, particularly if there's not the Iran uh, element, uh, becomes uh, less uh, and less useful uh, for, uh, for all three. So there's a range of possible futures, uh, I would say, uh, for the, the E3, and I, and I look forward to your analysis or commentary. So thank you very much. a few questions that I will start with and then, and then uh, while you think about your questions and I will um, you can sign up while Richard <coughs> answers those the first question I wanted to, to ask you is because you said that this format was not um, applied or used in, in the Ukraine conflict maybe you could say a little bit a few words about why because that was uh, I mean in 2014 so it was when they were this format was well established uh, so that's the first question. And the other, other one is, um, do you see the E3 as a, as a coping strategy uh, now, especially the, fo the new focus it has got now after Brexit? Um, or is it more, I mean, is, is it a way of, uh, of uh, compensating for the lack of uh, unified EU approach in, in some areas? Or is it um, to kind of uh, strengthen the EU or f European foreign policy? So also in area where the EU agrees that it can actually uh, be more forceful in international politics with this format. And of course, in the end, how sustainable will it be? Because now, uh, if you have um, converging interests between UK and, and the, uh, the other two, then, then it's easier. Um, but with transatlantic division, and you don't know exactly where the UK will go and how this, this will develop. So if you can say a few words about that as well. And while you're responding, I'm happy to, to note your, your names. Thank you very much. I mean, they're great, uh, great questions. And maybe to, to start at the end, which is uh, the sort of sustainability but divergent views. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the strength of the E3 format is that the, the commitment is a kind of genuine one in the sense that it's not just holding to a sort of treaty-based commitment or a commitment to work with the others because you're sort of locked into a kind of loveless marriage, shall we say, in terms of foreign, for, uh, foreign insecurity policy, but I, but I think the format can only be sustainable if, if there is not a significant divergence of the UK from the broad EU foreign policy position, because, you know, Berlin and Paris are not going to trade a diminished EU foreign policy position for a closer relationship with the UK. So in many ways, I think the UK still has to decide for itself the extent to which um, it sees itself broadly aligned with Europe. And, not, and one of the reasons why I think the E3 is interesting at the moment, if we see this as a kind of interregnum where we don't really understand what British foreign security policy priorities might be in the future, you know, Iran is quite a big test. Uh, and it's a test where Trump has a very clear line on Iran uh, and we have a very clearly defined European position where there is a real significant difference with the US. And so far, the UK has kept very closely aligned with the E3 position. So you may view that as being the kind of essential or enduring British interests, shall we say, are aligned with the EU. And you would expect it because the, the UK has been involved in building EU foreign and security policy. So um, uh, optimists for the E3 and optimists for a good EU-UK relationship in foreign security policy can probably take away from the last, uh, the last uh, 18 months or so a sort of positive in terms of having a firewall between the UK's difficulties with the EU as a trading partner 
and its desire to remain broadly aligned in foreign, in foreign policy. But I think then, uh, you know, your, your question about whether it's a coping strategy is a very good one. And then I think that in many ways uh, for the UK, it's a preferable format um, in the short term uh, as a way of coping with uncertainty as to what the parameters for British foreign policy will be in the long term. Uh, and in many ways, it sort of fits with what the British preference has probably been all along in terms of foreign policy cooperation within the e EU, which has been, you know, to see uh, to see a, a European foreign policy which is intergovernmental uh, and one which is defined in a way that uh, fits into a sort of a framework or understanding that allows Britain, France and Germany to align with what they do and the other member states to tuck in behind it. I mean, that's a very crude way of expressing what I think the British position uh, has, uh, has been uh, for quite some time. And that gets to the, the Ukraine <laughs> issue because I think one of the reasons why the UK was cut out of, of the Ukraine dialogue was because, uh, and this was, was when we had the David Cameron uh, uh, administration, that it was, it was very much eyes off Europe. Uh, and that uh, the, the broader government position um, of the Cameron administration was that it wasn't really focused on Europe or European uh, questions. And you can draw the contrast, for example, uh, with uh, the, the Western Balkans um, uh, in the early 1990s, where the UK was a very uh, uh, engaged uh, actor, uh, shall we say, uh, and was very interested in being involved in the process. Uh, and and the Ukraine uh, episode where the UK was not. It was just completely detached, focused on uh, domestic uh, issues. And the Cameron administration had disconnected itself from mainstream EU politics. And you, if you remember that history in the run-up to the decision to hold the referendum was all about the UK pulling back from the EU, uh, you know, both on Eurozone crisis management issues, but also um, on um, questions such as leaving the EPP and so on and so on. So I think, you know, the UK was not seen as a, a particularly helpful or useful interlocutor. Uh, and so the sort of read across was, uh, was one, I think, at that time, because the relationship between the national capitals in London, uh, uh, Paris, Berlin, rather, in London, was also not particularly good, um, that it wasn't logical to involve the UK. Okay, we have a few <coughs> questions. Uh, Johanna first. Johanna Saltnes Arena. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I'd like to hear your reflections about the new proposed uh, budget, the long-term budget. So uh, the EU has, or the, the Commission has proposed to have one common uh, instrument for external activities. Uh, and that might be a less flexible uh, budget for non-members, right? So for uh, the UK or even Norway to contribute if there is one uh, common instrument. Uh, there will no longer be intergovernmental budget like the development budget, uh, for example. So how would that affect uh, possibilities for the UK to uh, cooperate and perhaps also uh, affect uh, diploma more diplomatic activities like uh, the E3? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I mean, it's an interesting moment, I think, for all third countries who connect to the EU foreign policy making system, isn't it? Because uh, the most of the recent developments, uh, certainly post global strategy developments, um, particularly in the security and defense policy area, have basically been done with third countries as an afterthought rather than third countries being baked in to how you uh, you know, how you're going to structure um, the future and, and particularly now the move towards putting defence questions into the Commission and into the EU budget makes third country uh, connectivity particularly uh, difficult, especially if you won't accept the EU legal order, shall we say, which is the British government's difficulty, uh, which, is, which is why um, that doesn't bode particularly well, I think, for the connection of the UK, but I also, I think the EU, you know, has dragged its feet massively on PESCO, uh, third country participation in PESCO, which to me seems, uh, frankly, uh, inexplicable. Um, and we may end up in a situation in which the EU resources available for defence, you know, with the MFF negotiations, are going to end up with you actually need to bring in countries who have resources because what you thought you were going to do with a resource envelope is not going to be as large as you thought uh, was going to be the case uh, anyway. 
And I think also one of the things that it's clear uh, for me, uh, for, for the UK, is that we, it's, it's a strange cycle that the UK pre-Brexit basically detached itself from almost all aspects of CSDP cooperation, you know, both in missions, both in uh, operational headquarters, uh, battle groups, uh, and so on. All the things that you would have thought you could preserve under the transition arrangements that we, we ended up with. So I, I just wonder whether there is a certain self-absorption uh, in uh, Brussels about how you make things work at 27 uh, to the cost of how things you might work might work with others. And that then potentially stokes up difficulties in other kinds of relationships because perhaps there, there are many things we could talk about what the UK might do, but if you were talking about the UK and NATO, for example, it's very striking that the UK is doubling down on NATO stuff. And it's clear that the UK view of European security is going to be that if you think about NATO as an organisation, it's going to be very interested in the European pillar of NATO, but it's going to have a very different view of what the European pillar of NATO looks like from what some, some EU governments will think about, uh, and therefore thinking about how you might use uh, resources, how you might fund and how you might build capabilities through the EU uh, uh, framework. And that's where there is the potential for a sort of disruptive effect but it was also where I think you may end up getting less than the sum of the parts by knocking out uh, a third country. And that was sort of the British government's argument quite badly made. Um, but I think things like the Galileo experience for the UK during the, uh, during the Brexit negotiations, where the UK I mean, essentially was cut out of the program because of a question of EU law, um, has made it difficult for the UK to come back in um, and it's also, I think, means that the UK has also started to think about things in slightly different ways, such as satellites, for example, where it was really locked into the idea that it was built into, it, it wanted to see a sort of European capability being built. And that's, that view does not hold, frankly, uh, in London uh, now. Um, and it's, it's, I know there's been a sort of bit of walking back from that on the part of some other member states, but member states were not that prominent in discussions around that issue. Uh, and uh, and I think as a consequence of that, the UK, uh, we're going to end up with a less uh, ambitious relationship for the UK. And I think by implication for all uh, third uh, countries, uh, frankly. Um, I don't know whether that was a bit of a <coughs> ramble, so I don't know whether it asked the question, but I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, aren't there, uh, at the moment in, uh, in Brussels, uh, and particularly around the money question and the third country connectivity uh, question, that I guess... Uh, uh, are, are of interest here, shall we say. Uh, Ulf? Uh, Ulf <coughs> from Nupi. Uh, thank you so much, Richard. I think that one of the, the topics that you touch upon is, is of critical importance for Europe. So, so on the one hand, so I really think that what you're saying is, is really important. Uh, I don't know if it, E3 is the proper solution to it, but the way you bring up the issue is, is really good. On the one hand, Europe has to step up in order to solve some of the challenges, and at the same time, Europe is becoming more fragmented. Brexit is one of the fragmented factors, but it's not the only one. You have the east-west divide in Europe, and you have the north-south divide, and also discussion about values and, uh, and also capabilities, as we heard earlier on. So this is the whole environment. And you refer to the München conference. I think the most striking thing with the Munich conference was that Brexit was not discussed at all. Uh, until uh, Sunday morning, <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, then most of the delegates had left, and and the uh, UK was the only country not represented with a minister. He did, had uh, said while well, sitting there, he did a good job. But I saw uh, two things, uh, two questions. The first is, uh, you referred to the trade tensions, the likelihood of spill over somehow, and I think that the observation now, less than one month since the UK left the EU is rather worrying in many European countries about, okay, what is the UK willingness to stick to the agreements that were made, etc. So uh, how serious do you see this risk of trade tensions spilling over to the security issue? So that's the first question. And the second is that I think that the E3 might be a necessary solution, but it's not sufficient because a lot of things that 
is already in the politi the political declaration related to exchange of information about sanctions, etc., would probably also have to be dealt with some way or the other. So how do you see the relationship between the political declaration and the E3? It seems that, if I understood you correctly, the UK is ready to move away from all of those other declaration things and, and stick to E3, but I don't think that's sufficient. You need something more. Uh, and then finally, when you say that the E3 is designed to deal with issues where Europe tend to agree, but there are transatlantic tensions. So uh, have the E3 discussed Huawei or Nord Stream 2 or potential nuclear protection around Europe, etc.? So because there's a long list of transatlantic uh, <laughs> tensions <laughs> that yeah. could be discussed. Thank you. Maybe, maybe to take the last point first, I mean, I think that, uh, how should I put it? I think it's a bounded consultation. In other words, I don't think they're, they're looking for areas in which they, they disagree. I think they're looking for areas in which they agree. But I mean, the areas in which they disagree on Hawaii or, or Nord Stream, I mean, in many ways, get to the point uh, of, um, of how you might justify having that kind of format. Because if you can broker a consensus between those member states on, on issues like that, then you might be optimistic that the E3 uh, format has some... Uh, uh, has some uh, has some utility. I think we also have to be, you know, frank about that. This is this is uh, to to pick up on Peter's point. I mean, this is potentially part of a, a sort of UK coping strategy, isn't it? That um, uh, it isn't clear yet how the UK wants to think about bilateral, trilateral, minilateral uh, relationships, because frankly, the the uh, the political system in the UK has been so consumed with the, uh, the Brexit civil war, um, that the, the space for post-Brexit creative thinking um, uh, uh, disappeared all, almost to nothing. Uh, and, th and that gets to your, your first point about the, uh, where we are, you know, sort of one month on from the UK having left, which is a fairly extraordinary place to be, that we're talking about um, whether uh, commitments in the withdrawal agreement would be honoured or not. Uh, and and whether the the political declaration is sort of worth the paper that it's written on in terms of um, where the aspirations are shared by by both sides, it is incredibly difficult at the moment to understand the the internal political dynamic of the Conservative Party, which is in effect a kind of revolutionary regime which has come to power, uh, and it's not clear yet whether it sees itself at war with the sort of British state and British understanding of the world as traditionally understood, or whether it will accommodate itself. Uh, and to give a couple of examples of that, I mean, one is, one is um, transatlanticism. You know, the UK has always been a staunch transatlanticist. Even before Brexit, we started to see cracks in that transatlanticism. The cross-party consensus on something like NATO uh, has broken down significantly, partly because the Labour Party has ended off going in a, let's say, a, in a fairly exotic place, um, but also because within the Conservative Party itself, um, uh, there is uh, still uh, a working out of, of where people see this idea of global Britain, in inverted commas, and how that fits with their understanding of transatlanticism. Because on the one hand, you have, this, this is, you can see this on foreign policy very clearly, you've got somebody like the, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Tom Tugendhat, who is absolutely vociferous uh, in his position on Huawei, which is, you know, the UK should have no connection to Huawei at all. We should be following the US uh, line on, on Huawei, but arguing that not because he wants to follow the US, because he's worried about China and Huawei. Then you've got within the government itself, I mean, essentially a, a sort of more mercantilist grouping, uh, which is looking for trading opportunities with third countries. So why pick a fight on an issue that might make trade issues more difficult by making a decision? So the British decision on Huawei, I mean, it's essentially it's, it's a hedging position, isn't it? So on the one hand, you let it in, but not all, for all the way, and we're going to keep it set to, to a level. And I think that reflects very clearly the uh, strategic uncertainty uh, in Britain's mind as to where it puts itself at this moment. And I don't think we're going to be clear for quite some time um, as to uh, how that's going to work itself uh, out. Partly it will depend on what happens in the US in November. Um, uh, and a second Trump administration may see the UK pulled in directions that makes its life even more complicated, uh, frankly. 
But uh, also I think it depends on what happens within the trading relationship, which you, you started off with. And we, we now have a, uh, an extraordinary position, I think, where in effect the UK is, is willing to contemplate what we used to call no deal. Um, and, and, and not just to contemplate it, but to revel uh, in the prospect, uh, which again is, is a pretty extraordinary situation to find itself in, but because a lot of the dissent within the Conservative Party has been flushed out. Uh, uh, the civil service is also under a lot of pressure from the government to keep to a particular line, which is basically not to raise the real problems that exist in trying to manage that kind of, uh, that kind of trading relationship with the EU. So um, I think this year is actually going to be quite an important year for British politics. Um, uh, and obviously it's an important year in terms of Britain's relationship with the EU. And frankly, I think if you're going to predict where you were uh, at the end of the year, uh, you, would, um, uh, you would probably um, make quite a lot of money. But, but frankly, I, can't, I honestly <coughs> think that the scenarios um, are, it's all too plausible that there will be a no deal a scenario with a relationship uh, degrades to such an extent that um, uh, you know, the trading relationship or lack of trading relationship uh, uh, pollutes everything else, which means the security relationship breaks down. And with the Trump administration in for a second term, uh, you know the UK is is looking in in uh, uh, is not interested perhaps in holding the line on some of the issues like the Iran uh, dossier uh, and so on. So uh, it's I think it's really really difficult uh, to to predict uh, where uh, the UK uh, might end up. Perhaps the last reaction to what about sort of Munich is I think it it shows very well the fact that the UK uh, uh, didn't send a minister that first of all that domestic politics is all at the moment because you know the defense minister thought that he might be out of a job uh, and so committing to go wasn't something that he wanted to do he ended up being in his job or staying in his job uh, and ditto uh, ditto with the uh, with the foreign secretary but I think there's a certain amount of game playing in terms of some of these uh, formats uh, now as well, which looks odd to outsiders, particularly because the U.S. was so heavily represented uh, in, uh, in, in Munich. But I think the bottom line is that the U.K. is not really thinking so much about um, uh, uh, needing to be loved, frankly, uh, which, is, which is a worry uh, uh, for those who have seen the U.K. as a, you know, as a kind of reliable uh, partner uh, within, uh, within Europe. I'll just add on that, if, if there will be a no deal at the end of the transition period, I mean, do you think that will also be a final blow for the E3? Is that what you're saying? Or, or I'm, I'm not sure, because I think that uh, it's really closely coupled to the Iran question and the transatlantic question. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, E3 doesn't cost anybody anything, um, but the E3's value has been uh, to provide for coordination and delivering on sort of international public goods. Uh, in 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 a, in a way that um, perhaps you couldn't do in another format, um, but it's also equally possible to take the UK out of the picture, and the EU policy doesn't change, does it? So you can have you can have the E three minus one, which you know France and Germany have done for quite some time, uh, even if that relationship is not optimal uh, at, at the moment. Uh, and in a way, you know, I mean, there are many tragedies associated with Brexit. But at the moment in which, you know, Britain and France, perhaps they're, they're not running in uh, operating in tandem, that the UK opportunity to, to sort of finally break through uh, in terms of having a bit more of a disruptive effect on that relationship is the moment in which the UK can't because the UK is leaving. Uh, and the thing that would have to change uh, for the UK let's say, to benefit from, from difficulty in that relationship is if there were major order problems with the EU, which looks pretty unlikely, uh, frankly, however much some commentators in London might get excited about the idea the EU is going to fall apart once the UK leaves. I think that uh, when I said coping strategy, I mean the coping strategy for the UK, yes. Yeah. But also I think it's some, it could be seen as a coping strategy for France and, and Germany in order to kind of, and especially now in a geopolitical context when the Europe needs to play a, a bigger role and uh, when there are some, some divergences within the EU. So in order to kind of strengthen European foreign policy and ultimately also EU plus in a sense. No, I think it's a great it's a great point actually, and you know to back back to some of the points that Wolf made. You know things, you know there is there is a very 
there, there is a, a pretty shared worldview on a lot of issues between London and Paris, which means the cooperation uh, between the two um, works reasonably well. Uh, I mean, there are differences in outlook, but I think it works reasonably well. Um, but obviously, the, f the, the relationship between France uh, and Germany is, is more complicated. And an issue like Nord Stream, for example, you look at it from the perspective of, you know, sort of Europe's vulnerability, Europe's security, and it's just extraordinary. And it's extraordinary we don't spend more time talking about it, frankly. Uh, uh, and and you know, something like that uh, really strikes me as a way uh, in which you, you know, being honest and frank with one another between those three member states would be a really, really good thing to preserve um, and, and to spend a lot more time doing together in a way that's not necessarily to the detriment of other of the EU um, because there are some issues that you can't talk about in an EU context or, as I think with the Iran dialogue, um, that you might say that the E3 were responsible for its genesis they have remained its kind of godparents, uh, if you like, and they've been willing to invest political capital in preserving uh, that process and to use the instruments that have available, like P5 membership uh, and so on, in a way that's beneficial to sort of broader European uh, uh, security uh, outlook. So you could also see it's kind of coping in a way that, well, while transatlantic things are a bit less certain, while we work out what the strategy might be towards, or grand strategy towards China, it would be good if we continue to talk to one another in a structured way on big questions. And that would be a useful way to use the, the E3. But we also have to acknowledge, you know, the Brexit process does throw out all kinds of, you know, all kinds <coughs> of chaff that makes it really difficult to have those kinds of combinate conversations and I think you know to be, to be honest and frank that the 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 political leadership in London is also quite unpredictable and that does make it difficult to put down the tracks for a clear uh, future uh, structured relationship if you're not quite clear what the regime in London uh, sorry Ray, I shouldn't use the word regime for London should I? <laughs> what the administration in London uh, is uh, uh, is is thinking um, and it's also a bit of some concern, I think, in smaller member states if the E3 got too much yeah. influence over EU policies, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, that's yeah. a perfectly reasonable yeah. and responsible <laughs> position <laughs> to adopt, I exactly. would say. Yeah. First, uh, yeah, and then there. Thank you. Uh, Olga Narskagestad is my name. Uh, fisheries policies form a major dimension of any country, any coastal country's uh, foreign policies. And as we all know, the EU has a common fisheries policy, which means that um, it is the Commission and not the individual countries that conduct uh, negotiations with foreign countries. Uh, and the E3 format is obviously not designed for handling uh, conflicts which might come to the fore or arise when Brexit becomes a reality. Uh, so, uh, but it uh, does affect other countries and it will certainly affect the relationships between London and Brussels, or between, rather between London and the various uh, major capitals on the continent. So, uh, uh, do you have any comments to the possible repercussions of this, uh, of the Brexit to uh, this particular area? Thank you. Maybe just to say that you know fisheries is a totemic uh, issue in the Eurosceptic community uh, in the in the UK, uh, often divorced from the reality of the fishing industry in the UK or you know those who work in or, or those who fish uh, in British waters and where we export uh, uh, fish. So uh, I think it has a it has it has and possibly will have a major order significance in terms of the politics, the public politics uh, of, uh, of Brexit. And it's obviously also one of those areas in which there is scope for a great deal of fallout between, uh, falling out rather, between uh, Britain and France uh, because of where, uh, where French, uh, French fishing uh, takes, uh, takes place. I mean, it, it's also an area in which you, one might think that you could make a reasonably sensible accommodation uh, of the needs of, of both sides, but it's complicated by the UK for the access, frankly, access to the European market in terms of uh, how it's going to continue to export fish. So I think the EU's interest is, is the access to UK waters. Uh, 
And the UK interest, if it was being sensible, is access to European market for the fish that comes from the UK waters. But um, that assumes a rational process of decision making and deliberation on where we'll be uh, on on fisheries. Uh, and you know, if you follow the Brexit campaign, you you'll be well aware that fish, you know, the fishing industry, fishing boats featured quite regularly uh, in the symbolism uh, of of Brexiteers. So, I would expect irrational policy making uh, on uh, fisheries and kind of totemic uh, policy making on fisheries, um, uh, and probably not enough to to be the sort of first order issue but I think it would be it will end up being a major complicating issue if the relationship turns sour as the year uh, unfolds because obviously we'll get closer and closer to the transition period without un any certainty about for example you know access of other uh, EU member states to UK uh, to UK waters so it's probably one of those areas in which on the basis of a sort of no deal no agreement uh, you see some um, you see a lot of um, symbolic action, uh, shall we say, impossible skirmishing. You know, many people in the UK get excited about the so-called Cod Wars, uh, you know, with, with Iceland uh, that, the, that the UK uh, had uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the early 70s. Uh, and there is, a bit of, there is a bit of focus now, certainly by some parliamentarians, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the Coast Guard and, and inshore, uh, you know, the ability for the UK to, to manage its own uh, and own waters, which gets some people in the Conservative Party very, very exercised, um, and so it, as I say, it sort of takes on takes on an importance that's greater than the uh, the importance of fishing to the British economy. I have one more question. If there are others, please sign up now. Uh, we still have time for a few more. My name is William Bond. My question is the following: You appear to be quite uh, strongly f a Remainer. If you were to drape yourself in the Union Jack and be a Brexiter, how would that change your perspective on E3? I think I'm trans-Brexit. Uh, in the mean, you know, I mean, Brexit is a political reality, uh, and uh, and I think it is uh, a uh, it's a problem for the British state, the British politics, to come uh, to come to terms with. And um, I, you know, I certainly those those labels leave and remain. I, I don't think are particularly helpful anymore in understanding um, how the sort of public policy challenges of the UK would fit. I mean, certainly if you look at public opinion, um, there hasn't been a massive shift in terms of leave remain. You know, if you had another referendum, the UK would probably vote to leave uh, again. And, you know, all through the referendum campaign, I mean, I was sort of assiduously neutral uh, and spent time off my day job trying to explain, you know, how the EU functions. So I certainly wouldn't call myself a Remainer. So, um, uh, but I also wouldn't call myself a Brexiteer uh, either. Uh, I'm I'm a worrier, frankly. <laughs> now, you know, I'm I'm really worried about you know how how we work some of these these things through uh, in a political system in which we are still pretty cleaved, um, and at the same time, where uh, over the period since 2016 to to now, we s didn't spend that much time preparing for the reality of departure from the EU. And so there's a lot of catch-up uh, taking uh, place. Uh, and probably the most worrying thing for me is the government having ruled out any extension to the transition period. Uh, because, I mean, we are, if you just take you know, trade with Northern Ireland, uh, if you just take sort of customs, uh, you know, sort of customs facilitation, um, if you think about, um, you know, what happens to... Uh, supply chains in terms of rules of origin type stuff, particularly for manufacturing. None of those things do we have adequate arrangements in place to cope with where we may be moving towards. So um, uh, it, it should be, and it is, I think, a concern for anybody who does anything cross-border. But I think more broadly, uh, the UK is just less predictable than it was. We have, you know, there's a lot of talk around the Brexit period of the, of the UK worries that the UK might become more isolationist. I don't think the UK has become more isolationist. I think in many ways the UK is, is like a revolutionary state. I mean, it's a very has the potential to have disruptive uh, influence uh, or impact uh, without necessarily having a program for the world outside, uh, if you like. And the Global Britain thing has been a placeholder. It's been really a uh, label to apply to, uh, label to say that the UK is not going to be more inward looking. But the reality is the UK is more inward looking. 
uh, and the current government is much more interested in solving domestic political problems uh, and building a conservative majority for the next decade than it is, frankly, uh, in talking to securocrats in Munich. I mean, that's putting it very bluntly as to the way that they see the choices that they want to make. Um, and, and they see that the, the EU, uh, and this is one of the reasons why I think we've had this deterioration in the rhetoric um, uh, between uh, London and the continent, uh, is because uh, the UK doesn't, or some people in government don't understand why the EU can't see the UK as a third country. Uh, and and don't understand that this will mean that the UK will behave differently. I mean, that's the you know the language from the Johnson uh, cabinet, and we saw that in David Frost's speech that uh, that he gave uh, gave last week. Um, and and for the EU, and it's certainly I think in some national capitals, I think probably the adjustment process to the sh shift of the UK's mindset is taking longer than one might expect because probably people on the continent held out for much longer that the UK would see the error of its ways and return uh, or there would be a, you know, the Remain movement would triumph uh, in, in some way and it obviously hasn't worked out uh, that way and it's not going to work out uh, that way. Uh, and I think uh, uh, a referendum to join is a pretty unlikely proposition unless you sit in Edinburgh. Uh, Ulf. Thank you. Since there's nobody else, let me try one more question. Um, you said that the prospect for the trade deal looks rather dim, and you said the the UK has not decided on the kind of position it would like to have, and you also indicated in some areas that it might be quite irrational. Uh, so one. And the UK government has said already that they don't want to extend the transition period. But to me, it seems that the, the only sensible way forward would be to extend at least the agreement uh, or, or postpone an agreement on security with the EU because there are so many unclear things. And I think that in the field of security, it's much more likely that the EU might also change its position than in, the, for instance, in trade or state aid rules, etc., because there are limits to what the EU governments can do because of EU law, etc. So, so, uh, so the question then is then, uh, would the UK put forward a proposal on what kind of security arrangement they would like to see, yeah. and how will that depart from what Theresa May has uh, put forward already? And uh, thirdly, will they? Is it possible to imagine that they will? put forward a proposal of postponing the future negotiations on security agreement until after the trade agreement has been concluded. Thank you. No, that's a great question. Maybe um, it's worth making the distinction between the internal and the external, because obviously the internal security is, is in many ways, uh, and data sharing, those are the areas in which you can't dodge, uh, I think, or, or life is far more difficult uh, if you don't reach an agreement. And, and the proposition was there when the Brexit negotiations started. And this shows how, how, uh, uh, how optimistic maybe people were about the process, is that before the end of the, uh, the Article 50 process negotiations, you would have a new security agreement in place. It was flagged up as being the, early, the earliest agreement for the future relationship. And obviously, we've moved on from that. And the May administration's idea, you know, which was set out very clearly in a so-called partnership paper, was I mean, they were quite keen on the idea of a security treaty, they're quite idea, uh, keen on the idea of something that bridged internal external security. Um, and we haven't seen a comparable document from the Johnson administration uh, or, or since the demise of, of, um, of uh, uh, Mrs May. I mean, what we have seen, obviously, is what's in the political declaration. But the political declaration and, and the withdrawal agreement uh, were identical to what Mrs May agreed, some fiddled around the margin. Yes, we know that the protocol dealing with Ireland, Northern Ireland was altered, but I mean, essentially the text didn't, didn't change. Um, so the aspirations in the security and defence policy area didn't change uh, at all. I think where we could end up, you know, the scenarios are we get to the end of this year, no extension of transition. That means you have some real issues on the internal security side. If we're honest on the external security side, um, leaving the EU's foreign policy, leaving the EU's, uh, leaving the EU's CFSP and, and CSDP, has been pretty uncomplicated. Detaching the UK was a fairly straightforward uh, proposition because, of course, the costs of participation 
are not necessarily the policy today. They're where the policy might take the EU uh, in the future. Um, and, and therefore, um, you know, the, the absence of the UK voice um, within that, uh, we won't know the effects uh, for quite some time uh, to come, uh, I, I suspect. So I, I think that it's logical that you could and should have an agreement, but I think the, the starting point from the EU side uh, quite reasonably is, you know, what does a third country agreement look like with the UK? Whereas from the UK side, uh, the May government said, you know, we want to do something that's not like anything which has existed previously um, and didn't feel particularly that that was noticed and didn't feel that the withdrawal agreement negotiations um, lent themselves to the proposition that the UK was going to be and have this kind of close uh, relationship. Now, with the Johnson administration on what the future trade relationship might look like, the, the security issue has moved further and further down the agenda, uh, I think, um, and doesn't have anything like the prominence that one might reasonably expect it to have, particularly you know, when we've got you know, this, the, the challenge to the West, in a way. I mean, it's extraordinary that um, the emphasis wouldn't be on how do we keep the country, uh, how do we keep the UK connected, because the broader issues at stake are so much wider and for the UK also to be saying, you know, we need to remain connected because we understand that the broader issues at stake uh, are so much wider. So I think the, both sides are suffering from a, uh, um, a, uh, a geo-strategic uh, um, uh, dislocation, I think, frankly, from the, you know, the sort of reality of what we, we, we know is the major order challenge, and we're fiddling at the margin, crudely put. Um, but um, I, I sort of have hope that the, the Britain will recalibrate uh, at some point, um, but we're in the process of recalibrating. Somebody's hit the reset button, but it's taking a long while for the, the country to reboot, shall we say, uh, to get back to normal, normal uh, functioning. Um, and from the EU perspective, I think you know, the, uh, it's the downside of having uh, the way that we set up the withdrawal of the UK, which is withdrawal agreement issues being separated from the future relationship issues meant that they really stoked up a lot of bad feeling uh, in a way that it probably wasn't necessary because it was accentuation of the issues where there was divergence rather than focus on the issues in which there was remained a converged interest. Uh, and, and I think there's just this huge disjunction there between the political declaration, which is very, you know, motherhood and apple pie, can't we have a great relationship with the future, and the practical politics of where we are on Brexit, which is the two sides seem to be very, very far apart. And, and some, uh, certainly member state capitals, seem to be not necessarily leading the debate. They seem to be following uh, the, the line that the Commission uh, is taking. We'll see the mandate agreed uh, today, uh, probably published tomorrow, um, uh, from the EU side. And I think it's probably, uh, probably going to be a bit disappointing, frankly, uh, in terms of... Um, uh, in terms of whether it gives any ground uh, for the relationship with the UK. One more question here. And then. Bjorn Tore Solberg. <coughs> um, uh, thank you for the uh, great presentation when it comes to the um, E3 format. Um, my question is a little bit more looking forward to the future. Um, we have a number of growing security challenges, uh, not too far off uh, in time and also in distance. And uh, very often when you talk about security policy uh, and using formats, it's a little about how, what type of tools do you have to, um, I would say, influence decision making. And uh, of course, uh, the UK and France uh, have sizable military capabilities. Uh, they're at least smaller than they were, but they have nuclear capabilities, we, which we usually don't talk too much about. Uh, but they also have conventional military capabilities that are small but capable. On the German side, however, you have uh, political challenges, I would say, when it comes to using military capabilities. So it's, for all practical purposes, not possible to deploy military forces for offensive operations. And uh, the military capabilities they have are very, very low compared to Germany being a large nation also with a great economy. Uh, 
we had a large NATO exercise here uh, more than a year ago, and most of the German military forces that were capable to deploy were in Norway, meaning one brigade. And uh, the Air Force primarily doesn't fly, and the Navy doesn't sail. So uh, that is kind of a security challenge if you use the E3 format also covering into the more challenging uh, tools for diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that um, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't dispute your analysis in terms, of, in terms of capabilities. I think maybe just to, to run alongside that, you know, the UK is now embar embarked on some major investment uh, program, but the uh, you know the having the the two carriers uh, in particular is noteworthy, not least because those are designed to be interoperable with the U.S. Uh, and others, not to be interoperable with France uh, or with Germany, for example. So, in terms of you know power power projection, uh, if you like, if we could talk about uh, that as as an idea, uh, the U.K. is kind of configuring itself to be uh, uh, what I would call a kind of plurilateral actor. Uh, on security questions. It wants to have the ability to be able to do things in places that it hasn't done things for a long time in Asia, for example, or the Indo-Pacific. Um, and uh, that, is, isn't, that hasn't been worked through in a coordinated way with other, uh, other European states. If you take just in the EU framework, it's very striking if you look at the UK's national security strategy and and we're about to, to embark on a new strategic defence and security review, that in the last one, the EU didn't feature, frankly. If you look at the documents, it wasn't a major order consideration. France featured, and there was a reference to, to Germany and to, to Poland. And I, I would anticipate that the upcoming review will have lots of references to European states and not much reference to the EU, uh, frankly. Um, and the relationship with France will almost certainly be one where the UK wants to broaden and deepen, uh, uh, I would say. And I think there's an expert on France who could tell me, but I, my understanding is that, you know, there is a certain receptivity in Paris uh, to that idea within limits. Um, but the formats like E3i do provide means of doing things, but uh, they provide a framework rather than um, how you make spending and other commitments uh, in the longer term. I mean, Germany is, a, is, a, is going to be the major order challenge, I think, for France and Germany if they want, uh, France and the UK rather, if they want to do more uh, on the security side and if they want to up the ambition as to what they might see the E3 facilitating. And I think what we'll probably uh, end up with I is a lot going on bilaterally between Britain and France and the capability side of things uh, and a lot going on between Britain and France and Germany in terms of dialogue but dodging some of the difficult questions. Um, and what, what you really need is a format in which Britain and France say to Germany, actually, there are some things that you probably need to do. You know you need to do them, and we know that they're politically difficult, so we need to find a way of facilitating you doing them uh, in a way that connects you into, uh, into the, uh, to the EU if that's an easier way for you to do things. But I think the current negotiations on the budget suggest that that is not something that Germany feels able to do uh, if you see the defence funds uh, or the prospective defence funds for the EU uh, cut. Because, I mean, that's a way for Germany to pay more for European defence, putting it crudely, isn't it? If Germany is the major order budget player, you can spend more on defence, then Germany is, in effect, spending more on defence, even if it isn't through the German defence budget. Um, and that would be a backdoor way uh, of perhaps Germany doing some things which otherwise would be would be much more difficult uh, to do. The other thing I would say, and I know that's not directly aligned to your, uh, to your question, but the interesting thing is that both uh, France and the UK do have this interest in, uh, in the uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, Indo and they want to do more there. Uh, and it will be interesting to see how their relationship evolves in that region, and then how it connects with other countries, and particularly uh, the Five Eyes you know, community, which the UK puts a lot of store by, you know, this intelligence sharing community that brings the US, Canada, um, uh, New Zealand and Australia uh, together, um, because the UK values that relationship. Uh, and, and I think how France connects to that relationship is also going to be a very interesting uh, question uh, for the future. So I'd, I'd be quite optimistic, actually, about sort of Anglo-French relations being kept quite isolated from the broader Brexit uh, 
difficulties. Uh, I think, you know, as you imply, you know, I think Germany is going to remain an underpowered contributor to European security. And the question for us all will be whether we can, uh, whether the United States is going to remain committed. So whether we can afford that sort of luxury of not uh, paying our way or, or asking the difficult questions uh, of ourselves, because at the moment, our, you know, there's there certainly isn't sufficient work being done to accommodate ourselves to what could be a really difficult uh, second uh, Trump term uh, for things like NATO and for European security cooperation, just to, to end on a, on a high note of, uh, of optimism. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, if you think Brexit's bad, Trump's worse. <laughs> Okay, we, uh, thank you so much, Richard. We have covered a lot of questions from diplomacy to fisheries to, uh, to defense now in the end. And uh, it was very interesting. So thank you so much. We have to follow this format and see if it, it will become strengthened or, or weak, weakened. Or, um, yeah, so we will probably have uh, more seminar on this topic. Thank you so much for all for joining. <laughs> thank you.